Our next up speaker is John Stoner, and he is uh, the principal strategy uh, strategist for security at Splunk. It sounds like he has an incredibly fun job because he gets to um, play with all the new cool Splunk stuff that is constantly coming out and uh, promote uh, threat hunting and incident response using the suite of tools in Splunk. He's created a bunch of different blog posts on Splunk and threat hunting. So definitely check those out. And then in his spare time, it sounds like he's a hockey dad and a uh, 80s music lover. So with that, I will turn it over to John Stoner. All right, thank you very much. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about uh, threat hunting in the Microsoft Cloud. And so this is a very, very nice dovetail into Matt's presentation. Um, you know, as we start looking at more cloud hunting versus on-premise hunting, uh, times certainly change with that. There's certainly things that we need to go ahead and take into account. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of share some of our experiences with that and, and hopefully kind of try to, you know, give some folks some perspective around that. So let's dive in. That was a quick bio on me. Uh, as mentioned, I do a lot of blogging on hunting and SecOps. I built a little fun uh, app that does investigations and, and threat hunting. Uh, you can find me at Stoner PSU on Twitter, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. And uh, I one point had a uh, colleague who wrote this for me. And uh, on the personal note, I, I do enjoy listening to the Smiths and all sorts of other sad timey music as they refer to it. So my team razzes me about that on a regular basis. So in the next 30 minutes or so, uh, I want to talk about those implications of moving to the cloud using the uh, Azure and O365 as a demonstration around that and then talking about that attack surface. I wanna talk about the compare and contrast of the on-prem versus the uh, cloud logging that's out there uh, because that's an important thing to understand as you're defending as well as hunting. Um, we're gonna take that content and do an abbreviated hunt around Azure and AD and O365 to look at some of the fidelity that a hunter would have access to. We'll talk a little bit about and, and some of the findings of that hunt and understand why we can't rely strictly on the cloud logging um, because obviously on-premise needs to be supplemented and that's kind of a, giving away a little bit of, 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 of my conclusion there, but it's important to understand that. And then at the end of the day, since MITRE ATT&CK, uh, as Cloud Matrix was introduced, I wanted to kind of tie back some of the techniques we leveraged and show you where that mapped out on their, uh, on their matrix. So that's what we're gonna cover. So at the very, very high level, and, and I apologize if some of this is a little introductory, but depending on how much focus you have on AWS versus GCP versus Microsoft versus some other cloud environment, I want to kind of do a, a little bit of a level set first. Um, and so, you know, the, the cloud, the, the, the admin's happy, they've moved their uh, information to Azure, they moved their stuff to O365, all is well from the admin perspective, right? The challenge that we've got is that because of the goodness that you put into the Microsoft Cloud, it becomes a very, very high value target. Um, and, and there's a couple of different challenges here that I want to kind of just highlight. And these are all fairly recent news articles. Um, Azure AD went through a refresh on their sign-in page recently. And Microsoft Security Intelligence actually already has noted uh, a tremendous number of phishing uh, campaigns uh, associated with that new sign-in page. So, you know, they're changing their their way people are logging into the systems and, and what those things look like. The adversary is going ahead and modifying that view to impersonate and, and you know, and, and, and fool folks. From a password pray, spraying perspective, uh, it was noted that about a million hacked accounts in January uh, of those 80% of them were hit with either a password spray or a replay attack. And then with O365 OAuth giving complete access to an O365 account, that's also being seen in a number of accounts or a number of attacks, I'm sorry. The challenge with all of this is, is at the end of the day, once you're in, you're in, right? If I've got a legitimate credential and I'm in, I've got a lot of leeway to work with. So it's important to understand, and again, tying back to some of the things Matt talked about, uh, understanding and how we can go ahead and uh, prevent those things from happening. 
Um, another challenge that we've got is, is that logging can be a little bit challenging. Not to say that the logging isn't there, but you know, when you're first setting it up initially, it may be a little bit more difficult to configure because you're not used to it, right? But then you know, other parts about it, learning what, the, what it looks like, learning the outputs, we'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, and then we actually saw in some of our testing some interesting latency between uh, when an activity actually happened and when we actually were able to index that. And that was variable. That might have just been something that we saw, but it's those are things that we need to keep in keep in mind as we're we're looking at these things. Finally, the other concern is is that because adversaries are targeting it, it's a new landscape. It's a new um, we used to we refer to it as a savanna. It's a new place to hunt, if you will. Um, and there's new detections that have to be built, but we need to be make sure we're looking into those places and giving that its due. If the threat hunting team is only looking at the on-premise, because that's where they always have looked and they're very comfortable with it, there's this whole additional space that could be uh, could be under attack or or have clues left behind in it that aren't even being looked at. And so we need to obviously change our optics and look at those other places as well. So one of the common uh, activities, and I already mentioned uh, in terms of compromised accounts, was password spraying. And password spraying, something that's fairly well known, uh, DHS had put out this alert um, with the CERT back in 2018 about brute force attacks conducted by cyber actors. And we have collectively done such a good job in terms of squashing this and making sure that nobody has a problem with this anymore that the Australian Security Center in August of 2019 put out another advisory around password spraying attacks. And DHS CISA then picked that up and pushed that out as well. So you can see this is a continual issue, this continual challenge. In fact, the last time when I went back to look at this, uh, May 6th, the, that, uh, the original alert had been updated as well. So this is something that I think a lot of people are struggling with from a, from a prevention perspective and, and, and a detection perspective. Now, for those not familiar with password spraying, I want to kind of just talk about what that is, just again, from a level set perspective. A brute force password attack is something where I can go ahead and I keep using, you know, John as the user over and over with a bunch of different passwords. And the operating systems are out there, the SIMs are out there, they have good prevention and detection controls around this. It's a very well understood kind of attack. But with password spraying, you're manipulating and changing the user while keeping the same password over and over. So it does, or it can avoid the authentication lockout issue, and SIMs don't do a great job of monitoring these things out of the box. Now, you can use good password policies to help foil this. You could also look at using multi-factor authentication, again, something that Matt suggested as well. And so these are important things to keep in mind as you're looking at preventing people from coming into your cloud. Another challenge that we have is, is that we have to understand the vernacular has changed. So this is a short version of a mapping from the on-premise to the Microsoft Cloud. And obviously AWS has a different language, GCP has a different language, right? So from a defensive perspective, from a hunting perspective, we have to kind of understand what are these different pieces and there's mappings and I'm sure I've left things out. I'm sure things change over time with branding, but these are challenges that I have to understand. If I'm gonna hunt in this new space, I have to be able to talk the language. I have to understand what these different pieces are and go from there. I also have to understand the different levels of service that I'm getting, whether this is the infrastructure as a service, the platform as a service, the software as a service. What is that, what is that landscape and what do I have access to from a responsibility perspective and what am I responsible for defending versus someone else? Um, 2014, so I'm going way back in the, way back in the annals of time, uh, you, had the, you had the pizza, um, the pizza metaphor. And so this is my version of the pizza metaphor where you have the on-prem or the private cloud that you've kind of rolled your own, where you've you know bought your ingredients and you got to you know go ahead and roll out the dough and cut up the pepperoni and do all that kind of stuff. And you move into the infrastructure where you've got something pre-portioned and pre-wrapped. Uh, for any of you folks who've been to Papa Murphy's, particularly out in the Midwest, right, you walk in, you get a pizza that's already pre-wrapped, it's everything, you just have to throw it in the oven. And then of course the software as a service is the show up, you order, they bake it, they cut it, they deliver it to your table, right? But understand what those differences are between those different kinds of levels of service because there's different parts of that that you're gonna have access and ability to hunt into and have greater fidelity versus other pieces where you may have less fidelity. Another word of caution as we start hunting is, is that clouds will change over time. They'll change their shape, right? Service levels may change. And so the fidelity of the data that you have today may not be the same fidelity of data that you have next month or next year. So it's important to understand these things, okay? They, aren't, they, are, they, are, they are obstacles in the sense that it's just awareness that needs to happen. Um, 
And then it's also obviously important to look and understand what the difference is between on-prem Windows kinds of logging is versus cloud-based Windows kinds of logging. And let's go ahead and start talking about that now. So Windows event logs, right? There's a classic 4624 login event. This is what you see before you. Somebody logs in uh, and gains access. I can see that it's a log on type of two. I can see who the user is. I can see what process uh, the login was associated with. I can see uh, what workstation name it was, you know, if there's some network information, right? These are the kinds of things I'm very, very comfortable with understanding from a login event. If I start looking at an Azure, login event, and this is one accessing O365 Exchange specifically, you can see it looks a bit different. It's not bad by any stretch. It gives me some really good information. It tells me where the IP address where I'm logging in from. It gives us some nice geolocation. It gives me the username. It tells me if I'm using multi-factor, which you notice I'm not. Uh, it tells me these good things, but it's different. So it's under, and I have to understand what are the things that I'm getting here that I was, was not getting before and vice versa. When I start looking at stuff like OneDrive, OneDrive from a file modification is similarly does some nice stuff for me. It tells me what the uh, file name was that changed, what the path is associated with it, the specific workload. In this case, it's a OneDrive. Okay, so it, you know, OneDrive is a workload, Exchange is a workload, um, SharePoint can be a workload. There's different kinds of workloads that are divided up. And so I can get this kind of level of information to understand what's happening out there. And there's many, many more fields. I kind of got that in the background there, but a couple of those key ones I wanted to kind of pull forward. Um, on the messaging side, message trace uh, within MS Cloud gives you a high level piece of information around messaging. If I were to have one critique around it, I would say that the data around messaging is probably a little too high level from a hunt perspective. Um, for example, I can see the subject, the recipient, the sender, the size, you know, maybe where it was received from. So there's, there's, a, there's a few good nuggets there, but I found in our, in our actions and our activities, we leverage something like a Stoke that would allow us to have greater fidelity into the attachments. For this, you know, this was not something that gave us that level of fidelity to really analyze attachments that were coming in, um, pull indicators and those kinds of things. You kind of got, you know, this higher level view. And, you know, chances are for uh, tracing a message, if you will, to go ahead and maybe troubleshoot delivery or what have you, this is sufficient. But from a threat hunting perspective, we kind of found we needed something a little bit more. Now, I'm gonna talk about this next in the context of what we've done at Splunk with a, with a thing that we refer to as Boss of the Sock. So Boss of the Sock is a, is a capture the flag blue team exercise um, that we try to make realistic by building into uh, a nation state APT, if you will, and, and emulating techniques. Uh, we build training and education off of this as well to help analysts get a little bit smarter about this and we try to make it fun in the process. Um, so as we do that, and kind of with that in our context, what we did was we built an emulation scenario around a, uh, a, a threat actor called Taedong Gong APT. And in this example, Taedong Gong APT uh, has uh, gone after and attacked our, um, our, fic our fictitious uh, brewery, our uh, brew brewing provider called Frothly. And the uh, email here that was sent to Grace Hoppy, who is the uh, CEO of Frothly, uh, is basically dropping some information into this paste bin and saying, hey, you know, we hacked your email. Uh, we got this information and so forth. Um, uh, Grace has moved to Active Directory and O365 as part of her activities to move to the cloud. And so, you know, these were things that were extracted as part of that uh, emulation. And so we're going to dive into that abbreviated hunt at this point. Good news is I've got clues. That initial intel that I got was that Taedong Gong had indicated that they were going to use link files, or they might use link files, I should say, to gain access to the targeted environment. Now, if I have link visibility, um, I can go ahead and I can start searching. And, and again, I, uh, you, know, you might see some screenshots in here that look a little splunkish. Um, obviously, that's the tool set that I was using. These hunts can certainly be used by any, uh, anything else that you have. So really what I want you to do is take away the concepts that I'm leveraging here. Um, and the platform could be, you know, could be us, it could be somebody else, that's fine. Um, but I just wanna make sure I call that out. So, Within Azure, I can go ahead and look into this and see something like a field called operation. And operation gives me some nice, um, you know, high level activities that I, it allows me to go ahead and quickly pivot into. So from a, from a file perspective, right, I can see that anonymous links uh, utilized to reference this, uh, this file. 
Uh, I can see file accesses. I could see uh, when an anonymous link was created. I can see when that file was uploaded, right? So these kinds of things just off of this one field that's in, that's in uh, Azure allows me to go ahead and start answering some of these questions over on the left-hand side of the screen. If I start looking for suspicious link files, I do come back and see a number of link files, and I see some of them associated with actual users inside of my Frothly environment, but I see a number of anonymous clicks as well. Uh, you know, obviously I can go ahead and see that some people were clicking anonymously. That might be something that's good, you know, as I'm looking at my, at, at, at exercising this and seeing, okay, who's clicking where and, and what are they clicking on? Um, you know, some people, sometimes if there's, you know, you know, other, other reasons to, that I have anonymous clicks in there, those might be things I want to drill into a little bit further. But one of the things that also catches my eye here is, is that I can see that a file upload operation happened you know, pretty early in the, in, in the, in the, in this, and then there were these additional things happening, which obviously makes sense. I have to have a file uploaded before so I can click on it, but I can go ahead and pivot through using those operations to see this. If I start looking further into this and say, well, tell me more about when, who created this anonymous link, right? In that operation, because I have that information at the link created, I can pivot further into this and start looking at that raw event and start looking and seeing that it, you know, it sits inside a SharePoint. I can see it was in, in, in BGIST's uh, document directory. I can see that he was using a user agent string that if you look at closely may have a couple of uh, oddities to it that you may not typically see inside of a user agent string. Um, I can see his IP address, right? So, so Azure is giving me some really good nuggets of information here to start with to be able to say, okay, now where do I want to go from here? Where do I want to go from there? I'm going to go ahead and, and, and focus a little bit more on Bruce. Okay. I could certainly go ahead and pivot out to the IP address, but for now I'm going to focus on Bruce. Tell me more about Bruce. Tell me more about his activities. And I can see Bruce here has, uh, has activities by logging in uh, and engaging with O365 portal. It's fine. I can see the IP address he logged in and the geolocation that Microsoft is telling me, which is saying that it's coming in from Hong Kong, which depending on my environment, that might be totally fine. Oh, that may be a big yellow, a uh, big yellow flag on it. Right. But I can gain that kind of information from this as well. If I want to continue further down this route, I could start looking at the IP address and, you know, sequence my data and say, tell me, you know, from earliest to latest, what those interactions from that IP look like. And when I start looking at that, I start seeing that Bruce was interacting from that IP. And then I see another user named Theodore that's interacting from that IP. Now, because I'm a good threat hunter, hopefully, and I have also modeled my users and modeled my um, devices across my environment, I can also pull contextual data, understand more about Bruce's you know, access, which he's actually a normal user, and Theodore's access, which he is a administrator. So understanding those additional pieces of context may allow me to hypoth hypothesize a little bit more here, saying that Bruce was logged in, Bruce was doing some things, and at some point somebody went ahead and you know you know logged in with Fiodor's uh, permissions and which is an elevated permission, and the fact that they did it from the same IP address uh, would be another red flag that I would have out there as well. Um, so understanding these kinds of things, being able to sequence, being able to look at that, that's fine. In a Brick and mortar scenario may be coming in from the same IP address. Granted, this is in Hong Kong. Um, IP address might not be a big deal in our current work from home and distributed environment. If you know that might be a, a, a much bigger red flag. So these are things to think about as we move into detection. If I start to then taking a look at Fiador, because if I know Fiador with, uh, with the contextual clues I have has elevated access. I can start looking into the Azure Active Directory information to say, tell me about uh, his activities. And so just looking at it from a, from a sequential perspective, I can see an update user activity. I can see a add member to role. I can see a reset user password. I can see a number of different activities that are, okay, well, these would be things that, you know, generally I would expect a, uh, an administrator to do over the course of the day, maybe not in a compressed format, but these are things that I could at least start looking for and say, understanding what the scope of this was. Now, what I want to do with that next step is I want to start looking and say, well, okay, Fiador was the one initiating this, but what is the target? And so inside of the Azure logs, there's a thing called target dot user principal name. The, the, active, the user who's actually doing it is also called user principal name, but the target is who you're applying those rules to. 
So in this case, again, I start looking at this and I see that there are activities around updating the user, adding member to a role, resets associated with a, with a K-logger field, okay? I see that Fyodor is doing some changes to his own role, and I see him doing some changes to Bruce Gist's role, be Gist. Now, again, because I've done a little bit of my contextual work and I've pivoted back over into my uh, asset table and my identities, I know that K Logger field is actually a terminated employee. So why on earth is a terminated employee um, having a password reset or a role being added to it, right? Again, these are red flags that I'd want to go back and pivot out and look at a little bit further. I can also drill further into this to be able to see what properties are being changed. So again, you notice we've been looking at activity for the past couple slides and the, real, the reason I did it this way is because it can go so far deep into it, you know, and then I can't make it readable. So I'm kind of chunking this out. But the idea here is, is that I can look and say, well, for, for, for this K logger field guy, um, Theodore added him to a role. What role did he add him to? Well, he added him to the well-known object name and display name of tenant admin and company administrator. So for those familiar with tenant admin, I kind of think of this as being kind of the domain admin, but for the entire um, Azure customer, if you will, that, 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 that account, if you will. So kind of the full run of the box, if you will, the full run of the cloud in terms of their environment. And so that's obviously a big deal. That would be something that I'd want to be, you know, running detection on a regular basis and notifying when those kinds of roles are being changed. Um, there's obviously another lot of different kinds of admins that have other kinds of uh, roles there, but you know you want to be able to be looking for and understanding what are those values that um, that, are, that are being modified for specific users and what what that potentially means. Now, because I'm doing a an abbreviated um, an abbreviated hunt here, I'm not going to go into talking about Exchange in in any depth, but I do want to highlight that from an operation perspective, this nice operations view starts and is, is available in the workload for Exchange as well. And so again, I can go ahead and start looking at, you know, mailbox searches, transport rules, right? Uh, if somebody modifies, hey, send stuff to a blind copy over here, that's a transport rule modification uh, or a new transport rule. And I can go ahead and monitor for those and dig into that and see, uh, you know, maybe what the BCC was added to it from that perspective. If I'm changing a permission to say, well, only, only, you know, only John can look at this, but now, now uh, Ken can look at this, you know, that's a, that's a permission change that I would be able to go ahead and see as well. The last part of this little hunt that I want to talk about is the upload download from an exfiltration perspective. Now I can go ahead and see that there was a, a gzip file uploaded. Uh, and I can see the IP address of it. I can see that there is an archive.tar file downloaded and I can see the IP address associated with it. So I do have some level of ability of seeing those, those pieces of movement there. However, and this is kind of where the gap starts coming in and this is why it's an important thing not to solely rely on your cloud uh, logging is that if I'm looking even at just that one activity, I had Linux servers running on-prem running OS query that could see some movement associated with those two files. I saw wire data associated with web traffic to be able to see that. I saw Windows event logs, Sysmon associated with that as well. I want to have all of those different pieces so that I'm not blind to portions of this hunt. Because even if I was able to get 80 or 90% of the way through this, if I just had those three events in terms of the upload download, there isn't necessarily, there's, there's, there's dots there that I'm missing to be able to connect all of these together. So it's important to understand, I still need those workstation logs. I still need to have servers that are not in my Azure environment. And obviously if I can have network or wire data, that's important to have that to round out our entire picture. So what do we learn from our hunt? Well, we learned you know, that Bruce's account was compromised or we can certainly hypothesize that his account was compromised, that the anonymous link that was created gained additional access into Frothly Theodore's account was also compromised because he had elevated permissions. Uh, that account was then utilized to enable that dormant user K logger field and assign a tenant admin to remain, maintain a really high level of persistence. And then the piece that I didn't really show here was that we modified the exchange permissions as well to gain access to the emails, which is where, where Grace got that. And then obviously files were moved around Frothly from a staging perspective and then out. So the thing I always like to talk about when we hunt is what can we operationalize? Because we don't want to have to hunt over and over. Um, 
logging in with different users from the same IP, that would probably be, like I said, a big deal, particularly in the remote uh, work, work from home environments that we've got out there. Uh, depending on your network and how things are configured, that's something to consider. Uh, those tenant and site admin modifications, to me, you know, that's the immediate one. You absolutely should be monitor, uh, monitoring for those kinds of changes. Um, exchange rule creations, depending on who the people are and wh wh which groups they are. Certainly, maybe your senior level leadership or folks that have access to very, very sensitive information. We'd want to make sure that those things are, are being eyed. The file upload and download is very, very difficult. And I'll just say that straight out because, again, you know, I, I uploaded a, I uploaded a, um, a 50 meg 50 meg presentation to Dropbox. Does that violate my corporate policy? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but you know, these things happen on an ongoing basis, but maybe looking for baselining behavior, looking for outliers of that might be a better way to do it. Or maybe you just have some very excessive thresholds that you're looking at. Um, but there's some things to think about there as well, but that's, that one is a challenge. Now, in the last couple of minutes here, how do we go ahead and map to attack? So last October, uh, MITRE ATT&CK released their cloud matrix and they broke it out for Azure Active Directory 0365 software as a service, GCP and AWS. And you know, this is what it looked like initially. Um, I'm sure they're gonna continue building and adding more to it. Um, but if you start looking at this and what were the different techniques we saw our adversary do as they were exercising and emulating this, these are different things that we saw. So we saw this across the board. Granted, valid accounts fits into a number of these. Um, uh, and some account manipulation is in multiple tactics as well. But just going through that short little version with the exception of the email collection, which I didn't show, we pretty much hit on every single one of these that are in blue. And so this, again, I, I like to refer to this as brain candy. I like to refer to the, the MITRE ATT&CK techniques as, as things that are good ideas to start with from a hunting perspective. And that's a very, very valid approach by taking a look at these and starting to apply them back and start looking at this as you start hunting in your clouds uh, and not just on the prem. So to tie this all back together, it's important that you need to understand the difference between logging in the MS cloud versus the on-prem. There are differences. They're not better, they're not worse, they're just different. We need to understand both. Um, it's actually pretty easy to understand as you look at it, but there's also everything seems to be cloaked in JSON. So that's something that if you're not familiar with looking at JSON, you kind of got to get used to, and you got to get understand how those nested views look so you can kind of pull, pull them apart so you can find those modified properties and things like that. With any hunt, applying the who, what, where, when, why, how, along with those MITRE ATT&CK techniques really provide a nice way to be able to take this and pivot from there and what's that next question I need to ask. And then the last thing that's important to understand, whatever your cloud provider is, is that schemas and fields might change over time. You need to be, uh, you need to understand that. You need to keep that and be mindful of that. Um, and obviously, you need to have a good relationship with your cloud provider to make sure that you know that you don't get caught short and, and have a visibility gap. Uh, if you'd like to play with the data set that I referenced in this, we have the data set posted, it's open source. You can certainly download it. You can certainly download a blog post announcing the release of it as well. Uh, we've got it in Microsoft <laughs> Azure data in there. Um, by all means, please take a look at that if you'd like to play around with it. And with that, I'd like to thank you guys for your time. Uh, thank you for having me here. And um, I wish everybody a great rest of the summit. <laughs>